Hello, everybody, and welcome to the uh, SJAA uh, July uh, Imaging Special Interest Group meeting. Uh, I'm Paolo Barrettoni, and um, as you can see uh, from my, uh, let's say, name on the screen, uh, I am filling uh, uh, for iMervait, uh, that is our normal, uh, usual, and gracious host, uh, that is uh, good for him in vacation. Uh, so tonight uh, we will have again uh, Alex Voronov, uh, that is a new um, a member of the SJA and uh, is uh, uh, based in Tucson, uh, Arizona, and is also a member for other, other group, but uh, is uh, so um, so nice uh, with us to share his knowledge about uh, processing uh, uh, images. And, uh, and tonight uh, he will uh, talk uh, about uh, a very interesting uh, um, aspect of uh, the narrowband processing that is extracting the very uh, precise band from the continuum of that normally the window of the filter has. I'm sure that he will be better than me to describe everything. So please, Alex, go ahead. Well, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Okay, you should be seeing my screen. Um, so yes. as, as Paolo said, I'm going to talk about it, extracting emission lines from RGB plus SHO uh, image data. And uh, this is my second talk in a row, and I'm really pleased that somebody came back for the, to see it again. I hope there'll be something in here for everyone. I'm going to start out fairly elementary and uh, work my way up. Let's see, I can't, it doesn't seem to be forwarding my slide though. That's not good. There we go. So um, let me see, I missed one slide here. So we can go back, there we go. So ground up talk, we're gonna start with some easy stuff and work our way up into a couple of topics that are a little more advanced toward the end. So we're gonna talk about what are the emission lines we can and can capture and are worth capturing and some of the motivations for catch, capturing those lines, what can we do with them? And we're gonna talk about what emission lines are and how they arise, uh, some pretty elementary physics that probably most of you already know, but we'll make sure everybody's on the same page. Then you're gonna look at my equations for extracting the emission lines from the continuum background, which is always present in any image you capture and the assumptions and requirements for, for making that line extraction and extracting one line uh, from a broadband uh, image, for instance, extracting the O3 line in the blue, uh, from the blue RGB image. And then there's a problem, in fact, of extracting two lines at once from a broadband image, such as hydrogen and sulfur, which both reside in the red broadband image. And so I'll look at the equations for those two cases. And then roughly, I'll quickly show you why the only published thing I can find on extracting lines was published by Paris and Lozano this year. And their equations, I think, are demonstrably inadequate or incorrect, and I'll show you why. Uh, I wrote a script that does my narrow band extraction, so Pixinsight script, and it also puts together images, color images, using a uh, true color mapping or something close to true color mapping. Uh, I'm a big advocate of not using the Hubble palette, which I find annoying and shocking to the eye, but that's a personal thing. Anyway, I'll show you the, the uh, script and maybe work a little example and then have a suggestion for something interesting that we might be able to do in the future in terms of extracting emission lines a little better than we have what I'm gonna show. Okay, so where do we find emission lines, at least the ones we can observe? Uh, emission lines come from common 
elements in the universe. So we don't find too many emission lines, if any, from uranium or, or things like that that are very rare in the universe. Instead, we find them largely from chemical elements we're familiar with. And those that are in the human visible spectra are largely hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen, those three strong ones that we can see. Hydrogen, there are actually two lines. One's called hydrogen alpha and the other hydrogen beta. And then there's sulfur S2 line and uh, oxygen O3 line. And those Roman numerals indicate the, the uh, ah, what is it? The number of electrons that have been knocked out of the orbit. It's one less than that. So O3 has lost two electrons. Uh, emission lines generally for the stuff we can image arise in turbulent interstellar clouds and at high temperatures. And these kind of environments are found in star forming regions in those clouds. And sometimes when interstellar clouds are colliding and uh, sometimes the, the collisions are actually formed by the inter uh, star formation itself. We can also find these emission lines, particularly the hydrogen and oxygen in supernova remnants like uh, uh, the Ring Nebula and things like that. Some stars have, have emission lines. Most of them have absorption lines. Some have a few emission lines as well. And solar flares have emission lines, but I'm not gonna talk about either the stars or the flares this evening, just really about the clouds. So here is an example of an SHO emission line image that I made for NGC 6357. It's a strongly emitting, strongly stimulated gas cloud. And uh, the radiation is, is strong from that. And I pulled out the emission lines using my uh, script and composed an image that's pretty close to true color for, for this image. Um, I'll explain the true color part a little bit later. Not all clouds are emission nebula, not all bright nebula are emission nebula. This is the Pleiades and this is a reflection nebula. And uh, it's actually just like the scattering in our sky, it's blue because of the, the light being scattered, the blue light is scattered with its way shorter wavelength than the red light, which comes through more cleanly. The, uh, in this case, it's kind of interesting. Those stars are considerable distance behind the cloud and they're illuminating them from behind as the two pass in outer space. Okay, how do atomic emission lines arise? Um, an electron is in an, in an atom is kicked from a low energy orbital up to a higher energy orbital or kick totally out of the uh, out of the atom. This atom is then said to be in an excited state and that's unstable. It wants to have that electron and eventually, and the electron wants to be in the atom. So eventually the electron uh, resumes its ground state. So it moves from an excited state, perhaps free around the atom to the ground state of the atom. And as it does so, it releases energy. And that energy is in the form of a photon. And the fo energy or wavelength of the photon, it depends on how, how large the transition was. Was it uh, in all the way into the ground state of the, elect of the atom? Or was it part way down? And uh, we'll show a little bit of that in the next slide. So there's two ways that we generally think of as the prominent ways anyway, of stimulating a, an electron in an atom. And the first way is by having a photon hit the electron. And if the photon's energy, its wavelength, is the uh, energy difference between this inner orbital of the atom, this is the nucleus, and the a, a upper orbital, then this electron will be knocked into an upper orbital, just like this. And that's an excited state of the atom then. Well, that, atom, that leaves this orbital empty and it's lower energy and everything seeks a lower energy, it seems. So this electron is going to try to get back 
to the lower state, and we'll show that in a minute. Uh, there's also collisions. If you take these two atoms here and uh, slam them together, there's a chance that the energy of that collision is enough to kick at least one of those at, uh, electrons from the atom to a higher energy state. And then either this case or this case, we end up with an excited atom. That, atom, that photon, that atom, I'm sorry, that electron wants to get back. And when it does so, it emits a photon equal to the energy difference between these two states. And if we look at this diagram down here, it shows what an electron around a hydrogen atom nucleus can do. And probably the most prominent one where uh, these are a bunch of series which are based on where the atom ends up after it cascades or jumps to a lower energy state. There's the Lyman, the Passion, and the Balmer series. And the Balmer series is our most common one. And the Balmer series is where it comes down to the N2, the second orbital. And uh, this one right here is jump from the fourth orbital down to the second orbital is the one that emits hydrogen alpha. So uh, it's this process of exciting an atom through a collision, perhaps in a shock wave or through heat, uh, which jars the, the uh, atoms together, they rattle together and the electron jumps up or through absorbing a photon. Okay. Now, that's the emission lines, and they're shown down here in this diagram. Here's hydrogen alpha. And this line here, this set of observations in this spectra here, is the continuum. And you see it doesn't sit at zero. So when we observe hydrogen al alpha line, we observe everything between a wavelength here and a wavelength here. So that includes not only the line, but all of this continuum, which isn't very interesting to us. It has nothing to do with the physical processes in the cloud directly, at least not as directly as the emission lines do. So that's hydrogen alpha. There's hydrogen beta. There's oxygen three. Uh, what else did we want? Sulfur two over here, singly ionized sulfur. Okay. Now, interestingly, there are many things that cause this uh, background here, this continuum of radiation. It's very often black body radiation, which maybe you studied in school. It's which is just a mix of, of transitions going on, emitting uh, photons, uh, free free transitions where electrons are free in a matrix, in the gas matrix, and pass by atoms and change their energy as they as they interact with the atoms around them. Uh, molecular vibrations and molecular rotations also cause the background radiation. Uh, interestingly, the uh, molecular vibrations are called phonons, not, not photons, but phonons. And that term I knew, but in researching uh, for this talk, I found out that there were rotations of molecules called, or the energy differences in rotations that spawn light are called rotons. Isn't that interesting? Crossword puzzle. Anyhow, here's a, a spectrum, the one I showed before, last one with the buck with the continuum down here. And here's the uh, radiation of a star, uh, and whatever it is, V1150 Taurus. And you see here, the background radiation looks like this. And this is typical black body continuum radiation. <clears throat> this is probably black body too. I'm not absolutely sure, but it looks like black body radiation just at a much lower temperature. As temperature increases, this, uh, this uh, curve gets more peaked and higher and more compressed to the left. Let's see. These were taken by an amateur with spectrographs, spectrums. Um, now, what's a narrow band versus a broad band image? We're going to use both of them to extract our, our emission line. Broad band images, as you probably know, use filters that are about 
100 nanometers in width. <clears throat> and the common ones we use are L, R, G, B, luminance, red, green, and blue. Um, I'm not going to talk about the luminance, but we will talk about R, G, and B. <clears throat> Excuse me. Narrow band images uh, center around these emission lines, and they usually have widths between three and 10 uh, nanometers. And uh, of course, they emit far less light, and most times they take considerably longer exposure than the RGB ones, which emit more light, being wider bandwidth. So here's some astronomical filters just to show what we're talking about. So each of these filters is somewhere around 100 nanometers in width. And the red, green, and blue, red ones in this case, um, green ones in this case overlap with the blue a little bit. And unfortunately, the O emission line lies right in here somewhere. Uh, narrow band filters are, as you can see, these are on the same scale. Narrow band filters obviously much more peaked and tries to just isolate one of the bands. But you'll also notice that these broadband filters uh, span a range where, for instance, the red one contains not only red, but a little bit of orange. And the uh, green filter contains a little yellow, and the blue contains some violet. So they're not just pure red, green, and blue as we often treat them. Um, on a side story a little bit, I guess, is this diagram. This shows uh, the color range of various things. Let's just leave it at things for a second. Here's the human eye in this horseshoe shaped thing. This is what we can perceive if you have good eyes and good color reception, you should be able to see this range of colors. Uh, your monitor on the other hand, follows this little triangle right in here, the sRGB triangle. When you're processing your images, you can choose to process them in something like Adobe RGB or Prophoto RGB, which are much larger triangles and therefore have more colors available to you. The problem is, is when you display them on your monitor or anybody else displays them on their monitor, they're going to see sRGB. Uh, there aren't, I don't know of any monitors that uh, cover all of the Adobe RGB and none that, that cover Prophoto. So if you're making images to share with somebody, eventually you're going to end up in sRGB, whether by your own hand or by that of uh, the manufacturer of your display screen or by Astro Bin or whatever. But that's just, notice also that we're rather depleted in green compared to our depletion of red and blue if we use uh, the sRGB. And that's fine for astro imaging because there's just not that much out there that's that's truly green in color. And but if you're doing trees and forests and things like that, it's kind of a shame we don't get more of the greens. But we don't. Okay. Uh, the utility of emission lines. If I'm going to extract these things, what is it I'm going to do with them? Well, uh, one thing is make pretty pictures, and I guess that's covered down here. It makes things. The image is more complex, detailed, interesting, and in some degree, informative. It adds textures, shapes, and details, or at least it might. You're liable to extract all the, all the things, and all the narrow band emission lines and still come up with an image that's just kind of a flat white, uh, flat red thing, for instance. And it allows you to uh, better adjust dynamic ranges, tones, and saturations. Scientifically, uh, it tells scientists, if you use something like the Hubble palette, it tells the locations, proximities, and geometries of the active areas in the nebula, the areas where stars are forming, perhaps, or where clouds are colliding. Uh, this uh, obviously is something of interest to professional astronomers. Uh, it reveals the proportions of hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur in the regions to some degree. If you have red areas and blue areas, uh, you can, and, and if you're using a whole, pal whole palette, red, green, and blue areas, 
then uh, this would show you the distribution of these chemical elements in this space. However, I suspect that a professional who wants to know that would take a spectrogram of the area to find it out rather than taking a set of narrow band images. And I just found out today that the hydrogen alpha O3 ratio in planetary nebula is heightened, increases in areas of, of bow shocks. So tomorrow I will start on an image to see if I can see bow shocks in a planetary nebula. But just learned that this afternoon. Okay, here's another emission line uh, example I did. And this is mapped in true color, which I'm going to talk about in, in a little bit. Uh, but we're moving into the color thing fast. Uh, for those of you who like Futurama, and there was a period in my life when I did, there's an episode called Prisoner of, Bren of ben Benda. And that's when the professor, this is a cartoon, by the way, uh, when the professor gets caught in Bender's body and they're trying to figure out how to get him back uh, to, into his own body. And there's a phrase that says, I'm afraid we'll have to use da 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 math. And so we're going to have to use some math coming up here real fast. By the way, the guy who wrote this was a P, uh, one of the writers for Futurama, was a PhD in applied mathematics. And there's actually now a, uh, a mathematical theorem out there uh, based on this, this episode here, The Prisoner of, of Benda. So who knows where, you, where math is going these days. Anyway, here's my method of extracting the emission lines. Say we want to extract the green line, uh, the green O3 portion of the green O3 line. Uh, from broadband and narrow band images, a G in the broadband and the O3 narrow band images. We can write two simultaneous equations for the flux recorded by those two images. And if we write it, if we take B as the broadband and N as narrow band, let's start by writing the equation for the broadband. Very simply, it's the line, the emission line, plus the continuum equals the total flux that we record in B. Whereas in the narrow band line, what we want to do is scale it to the same thing. So it's the narrow band line has the, uh, the same emission line, but the exposure E sub N divided by E sub B, the narrow band divided by the broadband exposures scales how much of the flux we can attribute to L. And if we make that same ratio uh, to scale C, we also need to scale it by the width of the two, uh, two filters, the narrow band being, say, 10, whoops, the narrow band being 10 nanometers and the broad band being perhaps 100 nanometers. So now we have two simultaneous equations. We know all the E's, we know the W's, the two unknowns are the line and the uh, continuum, and we very simply sol solve them for the line, and we get that the line is equal to the narrow band minus A times B. B is the broadband image. A is this ratio, this set of constants, divided by the, uh, the uh, ah. So this is what happens when you get old, all of a sudden things go out of your mind. Uh, by E sub N divided by E sub B minus again this, this constant. This is the exposures, there we go, came back. Okay, now the problem is, is if we look at our narrow band red image, it can, I mean broadband red image, it contains two emission lines in it the hydrogen alpha and the sulfur two lines. So we have to write three equations and they look just like the equations we just wrote, except there are much more complicated uh, contortions of all the constants being multiplied and divided. And so instead I just simply write it in a, in a simple matrix form linear and solve these linear equations for 
N1 and N2, where N1 might be the hydrogen alpha line and N2 be the sulfur two line. So this is very easy to solve and you get both the hydrogen and the sulfur out in one, one pass. I should say one other thing. Uh, I have a script which I will make uh, available on our website uh, sometime this week. And I have a complete write-up that goes through pretty much all of this and explains it a little better than I'm probably doing tonight on the fly. Anyway, <clears throat> the underlying assumptions for these equations I just presented, which are easily solved, is that the continuum flux per unit wavelength of the broadband image is the same as that flight same continuum flux in the narrow band image. Uh, <clears throat> if you remember back several slides where I showed the emission spectra of a, of a nebula and pointed out the continuum, it was fairly flat. And so over a 100 versus a 10 nanometer section, the broad band versus narrow band, the, that assumption is probably fairly good. Not perfect, but, but probably closer than we would uh, expect or intuitively expect perhaps. Uh, the other assumption, number two, is that the filter transmission efficiencies are, uh, is the same for the broadband and the narrow band image. If there isn't, we can introduce another factor into there, the ratio of the efficiencies and uh, solve that. But most modern filters, both broadband and narrow band are pretty well, pretty efficient, uh, almost always above 95% uh, efficient and uh, often above 98%. And finally, that the, when processing them, you have to check and make sure that your narrow band and broad band images don't have a pedestal. If they do, the equations don't hold, but if they do, simply remove that pedestal before you do the calculations. Okay, now Paris, Paris and Lozano uh, this year published a, an equation which they called something like uh, uh, continuum subtraction, which I took it, and I think everybody else did, to mean that it's going to give you the emission line. And this is their equation. They don't put emission line on the left side of the equation. They just give you the right-hand side. So this is what I presume they're solving for. The equation is that you take the, the HA, that's the narrow band filter, and you subtract the quantity, the broadband red filter minus the median value of that red. Remember, median is the midpoint in terms of 50 percentile, half the values in the red filter are below that and half are above. And then you hunt around, make some tests and find a value of K that makes the image look the way you think it should. And you multiply that, uh, in the parentheses here by that K. So I'd like to point out something. This half the time, when this when R is less than the median, that's half the time, this is, uh, this is a negative value multiplied by a positive value, so it's still a negative value, and subtract it from HA, and so you're adding something to the hydrogen alpha. If this is continuum subtraction, what is it you're adding to the hydrogen alpha? And it can't be anything. On the other hand, if R is uh, less than the median, then this is a negative number. Is that what I just did? If R is greater than the median, then this is a positive number multiplied by a positive number is a positive number. And you subtract it from hydrogen alpha. And it seems like you're subtracting something. Perhaps it's the continuum. I don't know any physics that says that this thing here is the physics of the continuum. The equations I showed you just a little while are based on simple physical principles. This one is just ad hoc. All it's doing is emphasizing the areas that have more red already and de-emphasizing the areas that have less red. And besides which, if you have a nebula that only makes up part of the image, the median value of all the nebula may be above the median value across the entire image, which is what this median is. So uh, I'm not happy with that equation, especially when mine are so easy to use, in fact, and so obvious. 
Okay, finally, here's my narrow band assistant, I call it uh, my app uh, script in PixInsight for doing these calculations. It's pretty simple to use. You just select your broadband images for these uh, spots. They're narrow band images for these. Uh, there's a HA boost factor. Uh, how much of that red HA uh, subtracted from uh, found in the mission line? How much of mission line do you want to add back into the red part of your image? How much uh, red from the S2 and true color do you want to add in? And how much do you want to boost the blue and green uh, from the O? And you can adjust these, you can leave them at one. You can play with them any way you want. It also calculates an HB, uh, hydrogen beta emission, where you have hydrogen alpha in a nebula, you virtually always have a proportion of that that equals the hydrogen beta, and it's around 35% the default here. So that gives you a little bit of blue too. Uh, you input information about your narrowband filters, the widths of the filters, and the uh, broadband filter size, and these are the narrowband filters. And then the exposures of the, of the uh, broadband and the exposures of the narrowband filters. You can, if you push this value around, uh, there's going to be parts of your image, for instance, all of these narrowband images is going to extract, it's going to extract a hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen line. And those lines will, those images will tend to have black holes in them, areas where, where there was no HA recorded or sulfur recorded, et cetera. And if you push this line up, you can plug those areas by, by warping the equations a bit. Whether you want to warp the equations or not, it's up to you. Uh, if you leave it at one, there's no warping. And the images that come out, as I said, are the three narrow band images. It also makes a uh, SHO RGB image, according to the mixtures that you've specified up here. And it makes an SHO image with the uh, <clears throat> true color mapping. Uh, all of these are, both these are what I call true color mapping. Okay, now most narrowband images, if you're a uh, devotee of Astrobin, you find that most SHO images use the Hubble palette. In the Hubble palette, sulfur is red, hydrogen is green, and oxygen is blue. This is called an ordered color coloring or ordered palette because this is the longest wavelength, less long, and longer, shortest wavelength. Um, as I said earlier, professionals may like this because it tells them something about the distribution of the chemical species. Uh, I am not looking at the distribution of the chemical species, uh, and I don't expect any professional scientists working on with Hubble images or uh, what have you to go out on Astrobin and search down my images for them to do their science. Uh, they're going to use telescopes of a, several orders of magnitude more power. So I, I do mine for, for uh, art, for satisfying visual images. And I do not find the Hubble palette to create, create satisfying uh, color images. Furthermore, the star colors are distorted in the Hubble palette. They're usually magenta by the time you're done with it. Some people take RGB and paste the RGB stars in, in place of these magenta stars. And some others simply use a star mask and remove the color totally from those stars. Um, other observatories, by the way, use other one-to-one -one SHO mapping color palettes besides the Hubble palette. And those seem not to get very much playtime on Astrobin. So here's my mapping. And I remind you where the spectrum is. The shortest wavelength is, is sulfur. So I make sulfur red. I say the intensity uh, of the sulfur image is equal to the red, is equal to the red image. So, and I'm mixing RGB, that one's red. 
The HA is somewhat uh, longer wavelength, shorter wavelength. I don't know. Yeah, shorter wavelength than that. So it's off toward the green just a bit. It's rather arbitrary, but I said uh, I make my HA 17% green and 83% red. That puts it in the right place, more or less right place relative to the sulfur. Uh, o lies out here in the blue green, and I mix it at 39% green and 61% red. And then I make up this hydrogen beta, which I told you about earlier, because where there's a hydrogen alpha, there's hydrogen beta. And so I assign the flux at 35% of the hydrogen alpha flux. You can change that if you want and make it zero or any other number. And I set it at 20% green and 80% blue. Uh, eventually, in probably the next edition of my script, these equations will be adjustable to user discretion. Right now, they're hardwired in. Okay, uh, the advantages of this true, true color mapping is you can use photometric color cal calibration from fixed insight on it. And uh, when you do that, the stars aren't shifted a great deal. They're, they're usually shifted somewhat, just like they are in your RGB uh, images. And if you don't like that, then you don't have to go through with the color calibration, or you can isolate the stars and color them yourself. Uh, whatever, whatever was available to you with RGB is available here too. Uh, you can display your images at home or in public without having to try to explain what all the great, funny green things are in there, and green areas and what have you. Uh, as I said, eventually these will be adjustable. Okay. Now the images that you can output depends on right now on the Im images that you input. For instance, if you input just H, A, S, and O, and maybe these aren't the lines, maybe these are just the raw uh, stacks that you have, it, but it will produce an SHO true color image for you. If you put in H, A and R, G, B, or O and R, G, B, uh, or S and R, G, B, it'll help put in an H, R, G, B image and the H line, or S, R, G, B, and S line, or whatever you have. If you put in the whole kit and caboodle here, hydrogen, sulfur, uh, oxygen, and RGB, you get out an SRO RGB and HSO uh, image, both these being true color and all three of the lines. Um, what else? If you want to iterate, you can check a, a box here and it will leave everything untouched in your setup and you can, and when it reinitializes, and you can move sliders around or adjust whatever it is you would like to adjust. Okay, I'd like to go to a live example. Um, let's see if I can make that work. Let's go there. It's insight. Okay, I have here a uh, image data for NGC 3557, and it was taken on a, a plane wave, 17 inch by Deep Sky West, which is a place where you can purchase subscriptions to telescopes. And uh, it was taken in Chile. I have here my program, Narrow Band, Band Assistant. Uh, and when I open it up, because I prepared it already, we have the R, G, and B filled in, the H, S, and O. Here are the individual images. Uh, take that down for a minute. So if you look at, for instance, uh, the H image, oops, that's in the wrong place on that. There's, there's the H, what the H image looks like. So these are all black and white uh, standard stacks of images. Okay, back to this one. So those are all filled in. I'm going to leave the default values in here. My broadband filter was about for this telescope was about 100 nanometers. The narrow bands were eight nanometers. There was a 900 second exposure 
for the uh, broadband images and 1800 for the for the O exposures. I'm not going to screw with that uh, value. I'm going to make all the images possible, all three lines and the two combined images. So all you do is uh, take a deep breath and hope and push run. And it starts, most of these images will be deleted. They're intermediate images uh, where it's getting scaling. It's also doing uh, linear fitting uh, to the images, which takes most of the time in here. That's what it's doing right now is linear fit. Going down to, to the end. Okay, and it's done. And so here is uh, the line image. This is uh, SHO image in true color. Here you see these scars where there was no um, narrow band around these stars. This is very common uh, effect. If I take that slider and go back and slide the, the uh, slide this cosmetic slider up to maybe one and a half, all of those will go away. And the problem is at that point, we're introducing some of the broadband image back into the narrow band image. And here is the, um, the RGB SHO image. And this long thing here tells you that, for instance, sulfur uh, is in there uh, at a slider value of one, hydrogen at one, oxygen at one, and then there's RGB. And so again, this is true color. Obviously there needs to be some cropping done here on the side, but the star colors are pretty reasonable. Uh, it's a little harder to see the star colors in this one, unfortunately, because stars don't come out real well in narrow band uh, images, but they're also close, but uh, the intensity of this one needs to be boosted. The saturation clearly needs to be boosted. Okay, in addition to those, we have four lines, believe it or not. Uh, here's the hydrogen alpha line that was extracted. This is just the line without the continuum in it. Uh, here's the O extracted from the blue broadband image. So, so this is a uh, this is the blue component of the, of the oxygen. Here's the green component of the oxygen. oxygen. The images are not totally identical, especially in intensity, which is interesting. I don't think anybody has taken the effort to extract them from both those as you should, and then you combine them back into one line, ultimately when you use it. Uh, and this is the sulfur line. What I didn't extract, didn't show, is the hydrogen beta line, but the hydrogen beta would be just this image if you multiply every pixel by 0.35 and then add it into the blue rather than into the red somewhere. So that's how the, the thing works. And I'm so glad it actually worked. Okay, uh, some possible additions color mapping, as I said, so that the user can adjust the color mapping to true color or any other thing they want to do and increase the flexibility of the input such that you could just input R and HA and get out the HA line. Right now you have to put in all the RGB and HA to get it out. That's just kind of a limitation that's easily remedied. Um, here's my idea for the future to get a better estimate still of the narrow band images. What if we, rather than using broadband and narrow band, use two narrow band and took an image at five nanometers and three nanometers. This would have really helped in making sure that the continuum value is common between those two or extremely close to being common between those two. So uh, I've never seen this done, but if you happen to have a couple extra sets of narrow band filters lying around. Perhaps you started out with 10 nanometers and decided to go to five or to three. Uh, you might give that a try and see, see if it works using the equations, same equations I have. One of the, another advantage of this is 
uh, and it would isolate just the hydrogen, hydrogen and you wouldn't have to simultaneously uh, extract the hydrogen and the, uh, the sulfur, which must add a little bit of uncertainty to the images that come out. Okay, uh, I think that's all I have today. Here's uh, an image that's the true line version. Here's the RGB version. This has been processed and pre-processing was all done in fixed insight. Most of the post-processing was done in Topaz, uh, various ones, and uh, in Aurora HDR. And I think that's the last slide I have. It is. So I'd be happy to answer any questions or uh, whatever you've got going for you. I'll unshare my screen here. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And um, uh, let me let me let me start with a with a question that I noted here. Um, I noted that you use always very very good uh, uh, subs. I mean, the the data set are normally coming from a, a real good uh, um, telescope and location. What uh, uh, let's say is the influence of a let's say less than stellar let me let me pun intended uh, data set uh, uh, or i mean the data set that the the, the commoner like has can uh, produce in our backyard in that approach i think uh, one of the keys is always going to be um, suppressing noise and one thing that can be done is to um, operate on in some way to suppress noise in your unstretched. All this, of course, is the mathematics are all for unstretched images. So you have to suppress the, uh, the noise in the images before you, you apply these uh, mathematical tools as best you can. Uh, one thing, of course, we have at our command is more exposures. And uh, with these telescopes, I'm, I'm working with, um, oh, about three or four hours of SHO under very good skies. Uh, it, I don't have any problem. Uh, under skies here in Tucson, a metropolitan area, uh, it would be much more difficult. Um, the, I, I really just can't, don't have any personal experience with it, but it's all gonna be about noise. Um, I guess if you really think about it, you know, uh, you're carrying the noise through. So some noise suppression after the fact is important too. I usually hit noise pretty hard. There's now a new uh, AI noise tool. What is it called? Available in pic within PICS inside. Cost a few bucks. Uh, noise exterminator. Noise exterminator. I use that one occasionally, mostly not. Uh, most of my noise suppression is done after stretching, and I use Topaz Denoise, which is very flexible. And when you get used to using it, it's very effective at removing noise and not much else. Uh, that's, that's the best I guess I can do is, is try it and see and be aware. Maybe you know, whatever it's called, Mure or Mura uh, noise suppression would work. I never use that. That one's done on subs right after stacking. One other thought about uh, your last, uh, last note uh, about uh, the possibility to combine uh, different uh, um, uh, windows uh, in narrow band uh, in terms yeah. of filter, so different uh, window size uh, and I was thinking to the to the, uh, the, the approach that uh, uh, Francesco had with a multiple uh, um, location and people contributing to the same uh, uh, same image that is an approach can be used in that case I mean uh, uh, you have to scale probably from one uh, 
uh, image to the other. So uh, the pixel side has been different. Uh, yeah, yeah they, they, that, that, I'm not quite sure what starts to happen as pixel sizes get different. I think that's not a huge problem because of course, uh, you know, whether you're downscaling the pixels or whether you're aligning subs, you're interpolating all the time. And, uh, you know, if you dithered your subs, you're inter interpolating. And that's what you would be doing if you were taking images of different sizes from different scopes anyway. And of course, the uh, collaboration, as you suggest, maybe one person has one bandwidth of narrow band filters and another person has the other. And trading the data would be a, a uh, less expensive than, than buying two sets of filters. <laughs> Also, because a carousel with 20 filter is not an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. yeah. We need to get there. The JWST has like 15 filters or something like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, one thing that I it's not for me because I had the, the good chance of getting the pre-release of the script, but is there a, a URL that can be maybe shared in the chat where people can download your script? Yeah, I, I don't have the, I have a, a Dropbox uh, address and maybe what I can do is uh, just post that and sometime uh, later this week uh, and uh, I'll, I'll fix up make it the most recent version and post the Dropbox link where you can download it. Thanks. Okay, and maybe I will uh, do a, a broadcast uh, a, on, the, on the group uh, to alert everybody that uh, the script is available. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and and if at any time, of course, you have questions or suggestions for improving the script or what it's, what it's actually doing, uh, let me know. Uh, it only take, took me uh, six months to write that thousand lines. So, <laughs> Okay, so if there is no other further question, uh, we can, uh, first of all, thank you and uh, to Alex uh, for uh, a lot of food for thought and uh, thank you everybody for participating and uh, I'm actually uh, I, have, I have one last question so sure. Alex wonderful presentation really enjoyed it uh, mm -hmm. is it possible to share the uh, presentation itself and there was a lot of stuff quite intricate and it would be helpful for uh, newbies like me to uh, go over it probably multiple times to understand. <laughs> okay, well, I believe the uh, this was recorded, so it could be published that way. I will also uh, put in that same Dropbox, uh, my view graphs. Okay, sounds then, good. They'll... Yeah, I confirmed that is uh, recorded and uh, will be available uh, in few days. Uh, Glenn will take care of uh, processing the, the things. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. So, okay. Thank you again. Thank you, Alex. And uh, that's conclude uh, the July meeting. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.